Switzerland may be one of the smallest countries in Western Europe, but its railway network is famed throughout the world for its efficiency and diversity. The Swiss Federal Railways, whose extensive network of lines run throughout the country, was formed in the early years of the 20th century by the amalgamation of several originally private companies. With the exception of a single meter gauge route between Interlaken and Luzerne, the 74 kilometer long Brunig line, it utilizes standard gauge tracks, the rails of which are laid 1,435 millimeters apart. This width, which is a standard now recognized all over the world, was first established on the Willington Colliery Wagonway in Northern England in the middle of the 18th century, and later adopted by the railway pioneer, George Stevenson. The SBB is complemented by around 60 private companies, many of which are themselves fusions of smaller railways. The majority of these groups operate on a single gauge system, and companies such as the Bern Lurchberg Samplon Railway or the Emmental Railways are entirely standard gauge. The Raetian Railway, which operates in the southeastern part of Switzerland, utilizes meter gauge for its 375 kilometer network of lines. Other companies, such as the Jungfrau Railways Group and the Chemin de Fer de Jura, operate with a combination of either standard and meter gauge or meter and 800 millimeter gauge tracks. One of these mixed gauge companies is the Fribourg Railway Company, which operates in western Switzerland. It owns almost 49 kilometers of meter gauge and 50 kilometers of standard gauge lines, resulting in a variety of stock and motive power. The reason for this dual running lies in the history of the company. In 1942, three formerly separate organizations amalgamated. These were the Boul Romont Railway, opened in 1868, the Fribourg Mura Anne Railway, opened in 1898, and the Chemin de Fer Electrique de la Gruyère, or CEG, which began services at the beginning of the 20th century. The former two routes were built as standard gauge lines, allowing them to interconnect with adjacent railways, which were opening at that period, while the CEG adopted meter gauge for its tracks. Building on the narrow gauge route began in 1900, with the first section, from Palaisieux to Châtel, completed the following year. In 1903, the tracks between Châtel and Vaudance, and Montbovon and La Tour de Trême were complete, with the whole route coming into service on the 21st of September 1904. Connections were then able to be made with the newly opened CEV line to Vevey at Châtel and with the MOB railway at Montbovon. Finally, in 1912, a spur was opened to connect the important station at Boule with the Caillé chocolate factory at Bro. Our journey with the GFM railway begins at Palaisieux, where the meter gauge tracks lie on the eastern side of the SBB station. The important main line which passes through here was opened by the Lausanne Freiburg Bern Company in the 1860s and taken over by various private enterprises before becoming part of the Swiss Federal Railways in 1903. At 668 metres above sea level, Palaisieux is the lowest point on the meter gauge network and the single track way will be climbing steadily for the next 12 kilometres. Gradients are gentle throughout the whole system, and the maximum found along the line to Montbovon is only 1 in 31. Just outside the station, the line crosses the boundary from Canton Vaux into Canton Fribourg, where we'll remain for the entire journey. Freiburg joined the Swiss Confederation in 1481, its territory forming Switzerland's southwestern boundary for the next 300 years.
This part of our route was originally constructed by the Châtel Palaisieux Railway Company, which saw the commercial advantages of linking the industries and markets in the hinterland with the main transport routes. The easy terrain meant that it took less than a year to construct the seven-kilometre line, which opened on the 29th of April, 1901. It was run as a separate enterprise until 1907, when the CEG absorbed it into their network. The line was operated from the outset with the newly developed electric traction. Initially, a system of 750 volts DC was used, but this was later raised to 900 volts in order to allow the fleet to develop better haulage power. The two standard gauge GFM lines operate with a completely different power of 15 kilovolts AC, 16 2 -third cycles, the same system used by the Swiss Federal Railways. On the outskirts of Châtel Saint-Denis, our tracks merge with the line from Boulle over which we'll soon pass, for our train makes a reversal here. This was one of the determining factors in the adoption of rail car sets from the opening of the line, as there's then only a short delay while the driver changes cabs before the train is ready to continue on its way. Châtel Saint-Denis, the chief town of the Véves region, has been inhabited for well over 2,000 years. It takes its name from the castle built here by the Counts of Frouance, which was abandoned in the 13th century. A new castle built by the Counts of Savoy subsequently became the property of Canton Fribourg. Châtel's links with the railway have been relatively recent by comparison, with trains running here since 1901 only, and the line to Montbovon not in service until 1904. The same year, a railway linking Châtel with Vevey on Lake Geneva was opened by the Chemin de Fer électrique Vevesson. This route was closed in 1969, although the CEV continues to operate services to Les Playard Day. The CEG always favoured electric rail cars as the main vehicle for passenger transportation along their lines, purchasing 11 machines of various types between 1903 and 1905. They also took over the two BCFZE machines which had been in operation with the Châtel Pelezieux railway since 1901. Today, much modified and renumbered 13 and 14, these are used for shunting duties with number 13 normally based at Bro to assist with goods traffic on the branch line. Two early CEG tractors, numbers 11 and 12, dating from 1913, are also in service along the line. Freight trains are mainly hauled by two modern GDE 44 locomotives purchased from SLM in 1983. The majority of the original fleet of CEG rail cars has now been broken up although number 11, now renumbered 111, is still in service hauling some wonderfully preserved coaches on special excursion trains. She may be rapidly approaching her century, but is still capable of hauling a full load, although her top speed of only 60 kilometers per hour is only two-thirds of the most modern rail cars on the line today. The retro train is a splendid sight as it runs through the Greer countryside, 
and its lucky occupants can enjoy the comforts of bygone travel with the opportunity to enjoy a tasty cheese fondue or a glass of excellent Swiss wine. The GFM has also retained two special post vans dating from 1912, which are unique in Switzerland in having wrought iron balconies running the length of the vehicles. In the early 1940s, the newly formed Gruyere Freiburg Mora company purchased three rail cars, numbers 131 to 133, to augment the now aging meter gauge fleet. Thirty years later, four additional sets were added to the complement in order to cope with the expanding demand for the railway's services. And of these, numbers 151 and 152 are still working regularly along the network. They alternate with the very latest BDE 44 rail cars, purchased in the early 1990s, with which we are making our journey. Our way now changes direction and runs northwards towards Boulle and the junction with the line to Romo. At the edge of the station, we diverge from the Palaisieur line and continue to gain height, utilizing gradients of 1 in 33. The rail cars in which we're travelling are numbered 121 to 124 and all bear the names of villages found along the way. These were the first Swiss meter gauge sets to operate with asynchronous motors and are GTO Thyrista controlled with a top speed of 90 km per hour. Just before Saint-Sal, we crossed the N12 motorway, built in the 1970s to link northwestern Switzerland to the south of the country, via Lake Geneva and the Rhone Valley. This is a major traffic artery, and the road is constantly busy. Sansal, at 858 metres above sea level, is not only the highest point on this line, but on the whole GFM network. There once was a large glassworks, which specialised in making bottles, situated in the countryside near the line. This was a major customer of the railway during the early decades of the 20th century.
Vau Ru and the neighboring village of Wadons are each served by two stations, one on our meter gauge line and one on the standard gauge tracks of the Romont to Boule route, which is now running parallel with our way. The building at Vau Ru, Soud, is typical of the style erected by the CEG for a third class station. These masonry and wooden constructions blend harmoniously with the local chalets and with the winning design in a competition held by the railway in 1901. The only first class station is that of Chateau Saint-Denis, which was constructed in 1903 to replace a small wooden building. While the structures at Grand Villard and Montbovon are typical of second class station architecture and are today still staffed. Little wooden halts serve many of the communities along the line, providing shelter from the elements as well as a decorative line-side facility. The ornate signboards found on halts and main buildings alike are unique to the former CEG stations. In total, there are 13 stations and 18 halts along the meter gauge network. The land around Boule is largely agricultural, with beef cattle and dairy farming predominating. The milk produced here not only makes the famous Gruyere cheese, but is also turned into butter, cream and chocolate. The modern GFM depot at Planchy is situated at the junction of the meter and standard gauge lines, allowing ease of access for both systems. The railway is an important employer in the region, with over 200 members of staff on the payroll. The two lines run alongside each other right into the station at Boule, although their catenary must be kept separate as they're operating on completely different electrical systems. The town of Boule, the chief settlement of the Gruyere region, was already settled in Roman times when it was known as Boutelum. The 13th century castle, with its 32 meter high round tower, was built when the region came under the domination of the bishops of Lausanne. 300 years later, the area passed under control of the governors of Canton Fribourg. The town was badly damaged by fire in 1447 and again in 1805, and many of the lovely old buildings date from the periods of rebuilding. The first station was erected here in 1868 by the Boule Romont Company. Within 16 years it needed enlarging, so a novel method was employed, with the original roof being jacked up and a second story built beneath. The boule romont railway utilized steam power, and no electric traction was seen here until the arrival of the CEG lines in 1904. Initially, there was great competition between the rival railway companies, and a barrier was erected between the two different stations. After the amalgamation in 1942, the original CEG building was demolished. 
the old buildings were all replaced by a handsome concrete and glass structure opened in 1992. This provides a total transport centre for Boole, which is used by about 5,000 passengers a day. It incorporates not only the railway station, but additionally houses a bus station, which handles some of the fleet of GFN buses. There's also a large car park attached, and the complex includes a travel agency and buffet. Boule was the original site of the depot for the Boule Romand Company, and following the amalgamation, it continued to serve both standard and meter gauge stock. However, in 1986, a new depot was opened at Planchy, situated on land between the lines from Boule to Palaisieux and Boule to Romand, thereby giving ease of access to both types of stock. Inside the light and airy halls, GFM locomotives and rail car sets are repaired and renovated. A variety of different types of rail cars and coaches of both gauges pass through the workshops every year. There are also facilities to construct carriages and wagons, and the skilled workforce is justly proud of its work in keeping the railway running smoothly. The GFM operates a specialised wheel turning service, not only for their own vehicles, but also for a variety of other meter gauge companies. Boule is not only the junction of the Palaisieux de Montbovon route with the tracks to Romont, but also the start of the branch line from Boule to the chocolate factory at Bro. On the outskirts of Boule, our way passes over the river Trême on a reinforced concrete viaduct which replaced the original metal girder bridge in 1958. We share the main tracks to Montbovon for the first kilometre of our way before taking the left-hand line towards Bro. The village of La Tour de Trem gets its name from the 13th century tower built on a small rock outcrop which stands nearby. This five and a half kilometre link was first mooted in 1905, but work didn't begin until October 1910, with the line opening on the 24th of June 1912. The route was operated with electric traction from the outset, a natural decision in view of the CEG's success with this method of propulsion.
An imposing concrete viaduct carries the track for 179 meters across the River Sarine at a height of 64 meters. It's the longest structure on the whole GFM network. Originally, the bridge was formed of stone pillars and ramps supporting an iron girder, the construction process being assisted by the use of wooden scaffolding. Three quarters of a century later, it had to be replaced and the new structure was erected alongside the original bridge, the old viaduct subsequently being demolished. village is perched on the edge of a plateau above the river Sarine and the line must descend 30 meters to its destination at the Fabrique on the valley floor. In order to achieve this the gradient now increases to 1 in 20, the steepest on the whole GFM network. The chocolate factory is the most important customer of the GFM's meter gauge lines, transporting much of its product by rail. The Bro Spur, like the remainder of the CEG lines, was built with meter gauge track, which has caused problems in recent years as direct access to the main Swiss tracks along the standard gauge line via Romont is not possible. At one time there was talk of laying a third rail from Boule to Bro. However, in 1958 piggyback wagons were introduced to avoid transshipment problems and around 1500 trucks pass over the rails each year. Although the station is the end of the line for passenger trains, the track continues into the factory complex, giving wagons access to the works. The Fabrique was founded in 1898 by Alexander Caillé, whose pioneering grandfather had erected the first chocolate factory in Switzerland at the beginning of the 19th century. Caillé is merged first with Amédée Kohler, the firm which was famous for its hazelnut chocolate, and then with Daniel Pater, who would pioneered the making of milk chocolate. Finally, in 1929, the enterprise was taken over by Nestlé, who run the complex today. Chocolate is a product of the cocoa bean, which grows in tropical countries. Depending on the type of chocolate being produced, cocoa butter is added to cocoa mass, sugar and milk before being pulverized, kneaded and rolled to the required consistency. After further milling, the mixture is heated and stirred in large vats before being turned into a variety of chocolate products. The liquid chocolate is poured into molds of various shapes and sizes, with layers of chocolate and filling built up inside the individual molds on their journey along the conveyor belt. The finished chocolates are then cooled and removed from their molds before being automatically packaged in foil, labelled and boxed. In the year the fabric opened, there were about 120 employees working here. But so rapid was the success of this enterprise that within seven years this had increased to almost 1,400. Today the workforce numbers about 400 with the process being highly mechanized. While chocolate can be served as a drink, the vast majority of this delicious product is eaten. Swiss chocolate is exported to every corner of the globe, delighting its lovers worldwide. During the week, visitors are able to come to the Fabrique to see a special audio-visual display and sample the tempting range of chocolate made here. However, for reasons of hygiene, the general public is not allowed inside the areas where the chocolates are produced. We've covered well over half of our journey to Montbovon, and the line now runs in a southerly direction along the Sarine Valley.
We again pass over the tracks through the outskirts of Boule, which we took on our diversion to Bro. However, at the track split, we take the main line, leaving the chocolate trail to branch off to our left. The track has made a wide horseshoe curve at Boule, and our way now lies parallel to the line from Châtel, but skirting the eastern rather than the western edge of the mountain mass. The Gruyere region has been inhabited since time immemorial. Reindeer hunters lived here around 12,000 BC and Roman remains have been found. During the 9th century, the area was under the dominion of the Counts of Burgundy, with the Counts of Gruyere taking control in the 11th century. After they became bankrupt in 1554, their lands were split between Cantons Bern and Fribourg. To the left of our train, a distinctive trio of mountains, the Don de Bro, the Don de Chamois, and the Don de Burgo, form a dramatic backdrop to the picturesque hill town of Gruyere. The Counts of Gruyere ruled this region for almost 500 years, building a splendid castle and fortifying the village which grew up around it on an isolated hilltop some 75 meters above the valley floor. The fortress is the second most visited in Switzerland, only outstripped by the castle of Chillon on Lake Geneva. The walled town is largely car-free, enabling visitors to wander along its cobble streets without hindrance. The name Gruyere is probably derived from Gru or Crane, the migratory bird which passes through here on its way between North Africa and Scandinavia and which is featured on the region's coats of arms. During the 15th century, the castle chapel obtained a papal bull which granted indulgences to any of the faithful who visited there to give alms and pray for the Count and his family.
After Gruyere, with over 12 kilometers of our journey remaining, the valley begins to close in and the mountains on either side will provide an impressive horizon. The Gruyere region is noted worldwide for its tasty cheese and a show dairy is to be found at Pringi, where regular demonstrations take place. The line skirts the base of the Gruyere outcrop, giving impressive views of the town above the line. Our train now passes through the only two tunnels to be found on the entire GFM network. They're both short excavations, one at just under 200 metres in length and the second a mere 77 metres. After Epagny, road and rail run alongside each other for much of the remainder of the journey. The Gruyere region contains some of the largest forests in the whole of Switzerland, 70% of which are owned by the local communities. The wood is not only exported, but also used within Switzerland to produce furniture and kitchen equipment.
The Sarine, which has been close to our line for the last few kilometers of our journey, is one of Switzerland's main rivers. It flows through four cantons before entering the river Are below Bern. The waters subsequently pass into the river Rhine. Three bridges cross the river Angra as it enters the river Sarine, the railway passing over a new concrete structure which replaced the earlier masonry arched bridge in 1992. The Sarine is artificially widened here by means of a dam as the river's water is used to power a series of hydroelectric schemes along this stretch of its course. At the entrance to Montbovon village, highway and railway merge, with the tracks being embedded into the road surface. The village, with its neo-Romanesque church and old wooden chalets, was visited by the English poet Byron at the beginning of the 19th century. Montbovon is the terminus of our track and the junction with the montreux oberlin benoit railways line between Montreux and Zweizimmen. The station is owned by the GFM railway, whose first train arrived here in July 1903. Three months later, the inaugural MOB train arrived from Montreux. This was the end of their line until the following year, when the whole route was opened. Both the GFM and MOB lines are meter gauge, which allows interchange and the MOB occasionally runs special trains to the chocolate factory at Bro. So the end of our ride along the meter gauge tracks of the GFM railway need not be the end of our railway enjoyment. We can journey eastwards with the MOB and BLS railways to visit the scenic Bernese Oberland region. Here, lofty mountains form an impressive backdrop to the many attractive locations which can be found around the twin lakes of Thun and Brienz. Alternatively, we can take the MOB train down to Montreux, where there's the chance to explore the waters of Lake Geneva, perhaps aboard one of the fleet of old paddle steamers. There's no shortage of historic towns and villages to be explored on the Swiss Riviera, as the northern shore of the lake is known. There is, of course, a third option, to remain with the GFM railway and visit the numerous attractions to be found along the standard gauge lines of the network. 